The Tascam DR70D might be seven years old, but there's nothing about it that's out of date. Released on November 1st, 2014, it is preceded by the DR60D MK2, or Mortal Kombat 2, or Mark II, you can call it either. That was released September 2014 to coincide as a cheaper alternative to the 70. So the original 60 Mark Nothing, it was just the 60, was released in April 2013 and has silver bars instead of red. They are both larger four track field recorders, but you can't plug in four XLR quarter inch jacks at once. You have to split out an eighth inch jack for tracks three and four. On the DR70, you have the option of assigning tracks 1 and 2 to the stereo 1 8 input marked as EXT in 1 2 in the menu. But if you just wanted to record two mics max and pull audio from something with a stereo output, like if you're doing Let's Plays with commentary and then that's all, then you go with the 60 and save yourself an extra $100. At the same time with the Mark II, there's a switch for phantom power, which is channels 1 and 2 only, but it's a real switch not through the menu like with the DR70, so that's great. On the other side of the product timeline, we have the Tascam DR701D, which is a six track field recorder released in February 2016. And it has other features that go beyond that, but whatever, it goes for $400. So each of these is $100 apart and are priced based on their features and are still available new. But now let's dive into the DR70D. Okay, I know the manual, so I'm not gonna read everything, but hopefully I can make this watchable. Introduction, features. It's funny how they emphasize how it is so focused on DSLRs. Like it's the D, the D stands for DSLRs, and I think it's a really good field recorder. I think it's a good put it over your shoulder thing, but whatever, don't let the DSLR thing scare you away from this. So Tascam original high definition discrete architecture, HDDA microphone preamps provide high quality recording inputs. They do, I like them, they're very clean. In addition to ordinary stereo recording, simultaneous recording of up to four channels is possible. It's a four track recorder, I would hope that. Dual recording functions allows two files to be recorded simultaneously at different levels. That's the like negative 12 dB safety track in case you think you're gonna clip. I don't use it, but it is worthwhile to have. So don't don't listen to people who are like, oh, if you did it right, you wouldn't need it. Like, you know, you're doing it wrong. Like, yeah, you can't always predict what's going to happen with audio. It can be very variable. And if you can't check it, that's even worse. When you can't control everything, dual channel recording is very valuable. Or dual recording function, whatever it is. Camera out, lets audio go from this unit to the DSLR camera or anything, anything. It doesn't have to be to a DSLR. Camera in enables convenient monitoring of audio from DSLR camera. Limiter function, automatically reduce parts where the input level is too high to suitable levels. Don't trust it though, it's a digital limiter. I don't, I don't use the limiter. If you're recording 24 bit, you don't need a limiter. Set your levels. So there's this little negative 12 mark here. Uh, that's what I set it for. I don't set my levels for being like, oh, let me get is like, how loud am I going to be? I set it to aiming for negative 12 on average and recording 24 bit. So I have a lot of headroom to expand that in post, boost it. it. Remember these good preamps, whatever they're called. High definition discrete architecture, HDDA. Preamps, they're clean. You boost that up. I boost that. I think I boost, I mean, I'm going through a compressor. I'm going through a limiter in Premiere, but I'm probably boosting like 15 decibels. Clipping should be a very rare thing. Anyways, I'll, we'll get into that. Low cut filter conveniently reduces low frequency noise. A low cut filter, it's, um, if you're like doing something where it's like you want it encoded on the camera and, and whatever you're doing is gonna fly out like right away and you're not doing anything, then that's important to you. But a lot of that stuff is like something you would do in post. You don't need to low cut. When you're actually recording, just you have it, throw it up into a template and you're, um, you already got it. But I guess if you're like, oh, I'm recording something and there's a bunch of motorcycles rumbling around and it's like, I'm not gonna be editing this, then go for it. Delay function that eliminates time lags caused by differences in distance of two sets of outputs from the sound source. So if you got mics in two different spots, again, that's more like if you're doing it on the spot and you're not gonna edit, but if you're gonna edit, you can check your peaks and manually adjust everything. 128 by 
64 dot matrix LCD with backlight, which you could set the things to how long it goes. You know, it, it works to save the battery. So, which I am going very low on my battery. So, you know, you save that battery. Micro B USB 2.0 port. I don't know how useful that is the way I use it. I don't know. But you don't really get firmware updates from Tascam. Operates on four AA batteries, an AC adapter, which I don't know, I could use that AC adapter now with the way my battery's going. And uh, whatever battery pack or USB bus power. Oh, I could plug in bus, but whatever, we'll deal with that. Tripod mounting thread at the bottom and DSLR screw attachment that allows attachment and removal with the coin on the top. I removed that because it's a little spinny thing. It's just a chance that you might be making noise while handling it, so I took it off. Hold function to prevent accidental operation. You know, like you have it set and then you're touching stuff. Guards on the front left sides to protect the screen. These are the guards, which to me, they're strap holders, whatever. I guess they work as both, but it doesn't come with the strap. But the first thing I did was I need a strap on this thing. So I'm pretty sure, I mean, the way you would use it, those are also strap holders. Because otherwise the ergonomics would be horrible. The reason I got this is because is the ergonomics to be used with the strap very easily. And then it sits on a table in a way where you can read it easy. You're not, you don't have to look down. You don't have to mount it up. That's why form factor. That's why I got that. Okay, so whatever. Let's get let's get into it. You can use 64 megabyte to 2 gigabyte SD cards, 4 gigabyte to 32 gigabyte SD HD cards. I have 32, and 48 to 128 gigabyte SD XC cards with this unit. With this, 32 gigabytes is enough for me, enough to keep stuff on it, so I don't have to delete stuff right away. I can go for months. Audio files, 24 bit audio files, don't take up that much space. Yeah, if you're recording four tracks at once then you're, you're gonna run out of space faster, so you wanna be aware of that. Part two, names and functions of parts. Okay, this is where we get diagrams. These diagrams are so clean. You think of manuals back in the day, you got the like Xerox copy of stuff, and you're trying to see like, well, what is that? Okay, so we got the built-in stereo microphone, omnidirectional stereo ectret. What, I've never heard that word before in my life. Condenser microphone. I don't use that for these microphones. I mean, I've used it, in a pinch, but it's not the reason you're getting this. This is what stereo mics sound like. Stereo is not ideal for dialogue. But I guess, yeah, if you have nothing else, it could be better than an iPhone. At the very least, you can have it closer to something. So you got the cover for the battery. Battery compartment installs four AA batteries. Use rechargeable batteries. So yeah, I use uh, nickel metal hydrate batteries. They last about three, three and a half hours. I know when you see those bars, so yeah, it's like, oh, be anxious, there's one bar. Technically, it goes to a thing where there's just the battery and it shows nothing, and that's when you gotta be like, okay, like, let's let's stop this. So when it says nothing, let me know, and I'll change the batteries and I'll come back later. So the rear panel, I don't know why it says the rear panel, this looks like the front panel, but whatever. Is this, the, are they calling the back the front? I guess they are, but okay. We'll let, we'll, we'll let it go. I mean, they are the ones who made it. Um, but really, I think this is the front. Call it the rear. They're calling it the front because the mics are on there, but whatever. So display shows a variety of information. Yeah, so you got all this stuff. Uh, data dial, uh, you know, it's basically you spin it around to select things and you also push it in to be like an enter button. So the menu button, which is kind of like your button you're gonna be using the most for going in the menu is, uh, so yeah, they're calling it a home screen. Like right now, this is the home screen. You press it and it goes in the menu. And you got a bunch of pages of menu and you'll be scrolling through it with there, but I only use the, the first, I only use page one and three most of the time. So you got your volume knobs and your peak level indicators. So these are not incremental clicking knobs. It's just free spinning knobs. It's very easy to pick this thing up and hit the knobs and adjust them. I've done it before, it sucks. I don't allow clipping in my audio. So when I have done that, I've had to re-record audio. It's not fun. Uh, so always double check, whenever you move that, always double check, check your levels, check, check, check everything. Now we're going into, they're going in a weird order, but whatever. Um, I'm going to, I'm going to do it in my own order. Uh, stop, play, forward track, back track, which also double as things for when you're in menus. It basically one, two, three, four corresponds to things you're doing in the menus, two tracks, one, two, three, and four. So whenever you get in a menu, your data dialing, and then you're using this to jump to if you want to set things like for track three. I record my my mic on track three. Uh, that has my phantom power. That's what this input is, track three. So you got one, two, three, 
four. So if I'm going and I'm switching stuff, like I want to enable a track, like say I want to do a stereo recording on tracks one and two, which I usually plug into EXT in one, two, and then I'm going to go into the menu. I'm going to go to that thing and I'm going to hit one, set that for arming track one and two, set that for arming track two. And that's how you jump around easy. So when you're recording dual, you got an orange light with your, with your red light. And then obviously this is the recording light. All the knobs do the same things. It's just tracks one, two, three, four. So yeah, like and when normally this is for playback. If you're playing a track, if you're pressing play on it and you got your headphones and you're monitoring it, you jump forward a track, you jump back a track. Use the jog wheel to like, if you want to move within the track, like if you want to advance to like a minute in or something. Slate button is like a thing. I mean, for what I do, clapping is what I do. Uh, but if you're doing some kind of where you're all uh, synced with your camera, it basically puts down a tone on the track. It doesn't help me with this because it's not gonna put it down. I'm recording on an iPhone here. Uh, I want it so I can sync up my iPhone to this. I keep it separate. It's not, it's, e it's easy. It's really easy to sync in Premiere, but you do wanna check in front of the camera and make sure that your phone's audio is in sync because it's gonna base it off of your phone's audio to this. I'll do things, I'll record. Filmic Pro, there's a two frame delay usually. Uh, it can vary depending on if you're using remote or whatever, between one and three frames. And you want it to be, so the clap is when it's like this. It'll usually be because if I'm recording 24 frames a second, this is recording a higher time sampling, but when you're recording video, the difference between here and here is a gray area here. But really what it's down to is that as long as the clap is perceptively when you're either really blurry close or actually hitting, then you're in sync. So I usually have to do a little one, two frame adjustment in post. Okay, left side panel, you have your hold switch and it's also your power off switch. So up is hold and you pull down and you hold it for a while to turn it off and it does a little animation. And oh yeah, it's also for turning it on too. So it's very much a hold it for two seconds to do the on and off. Every time you start it up, it asks you if you want to be in phantom power. There is actually a bug in this where sometimes if it starts up, even though you're in phantom power and it doesn't ask you that, then something happened, you gotta re-enable phantom power. Go to your menu and just turn phantom power on and off again. That is the most notable bug in this is that sometimes it gets confused about phantom power. Oh yeah, there's also a warning about unplugging while phantom power is on. So it's the idea that disconnecting something that has power going to it could damage uh, something, the mic. Okay, right side panel, same thing, except the number four is on this side. EXT in one, two, jack. So it can only be tracks one and two. If you're recording, like say, say you're recording video game footage and you want to plug directly into your console, it can only be one, two, you have to change it in the menu. If you want to make something like a stereo recording, you can do a splitter and like you want to do an RCA in. So like you say you have the console does RCA only. You have your RCA stereo one, two, that's if we're doing stereo, into a converter RCA and then to a one eighth and you just do that. Okay, so remote connector. There's a little remote thing. Yeah, I don't have that, but there's a foot switch and a wired remote control. Camera in connector, connect audio output from a camera. So in is camera going into the unit. If you have a mic connected to your camera and it's going in the camera, if you wanna send that audio out to this, cause say maybe you're also recording a bunch of other stuff at once and you wanna be able to hear it all in one thing, then you would input audio from the camera. If you wanna record from this, like you have a mic plugged into this, then you wanna go out to the camera to send the audio to the camera to encode that what's on here in the master video file, like so you don't have to sync it in post, then you're going out. So it's out from device to camera. So phones, and they have their own independent audio control, which is monitoring, which is separate from this. Whatever you do on this does not affect your recording at all. There's a thing showing the cold shoe on top. What is it, the top panel? So yeah, I took this off just cause it's a little thing. It, could make sound and I don't use it. You would mount like a, a camera on top. I have a DSLR, but I don't really use it that way. I use my iPhone. My iPhone is better than my DSLR for most video. So I never use it that way, but it is very useful to have the camera above this. So when you take this off, 
there's just a shoe here. So if you want to have a mic connected directly to it with a shoe mount, you could. Or I suppose there's a bunch of things you can have connected to that. Whatever fits in a cold shoe. And then the bottom is uh, for mounting to a tripod. So you'd have the tripod, this, and the camera. Okay, so now the home screen. There's an indicator. Right now this is an indicator for it is recording. But there's also stop, pause, play, and, and then whatever functions you're doing here. There's the time, so you could see I've been recording for 28 minutes. I'm not sure how I'm gonna make this video the right length, but uh, ideally this is not gonna be more than 30 minutes. So we'll see how I can edit this down. So you have monitoring mode. Shows what audio is now being monitored. So right now it's monitoring the mix. The other version would be cam. If a camera was going into the input, you would set your monitor to the camera. But in the case of this, where it's just this, not connected to anything, mix. Battery supply status. Oh, there's only three, uh, oh, there's 10 levels. So this isn't the lowest level. There is actually a sliver that is a little more cut. And then there is, the battery is empty and that means it's almost dead. And it does turn off. You would assume that it saves your file and then it turns itself off. So what you assume from a lot of things now, but I don't trust that. If the battery is low, I get nervous and I just say, let's take a break and charge the batteries or have extra batteries. And then, yeah, we got our level meters. They go this way. Uh, that's a negative 12 mark right there. When you're peaking, you see the red light. So I believe that's negative 24. Obviously, I'm not facing the mic right now. Um, the mic is right here. I'm hiding it behind this. Yeah, there's peak value. It occurs in a fixed period of time. So whatever that fixed period of time is. So if you're peaking and you're not sure about it, there's a little check right there for it. So if these were selected, low cut, limiter, and hold, they would be, it would be black filled in and the text would be inverted. The only one I would use is hold. Pull that up and, I, and then hold would be like, oh, you can't do any input. And then you push it down to disable hold. So, okay, on to the menu item. So this thing's known for having a lot of menu items. Uh, basic is where you make recording settings. Monitor, where you make settings to the monitor. Monitoring, like being able to hear. And input is where you make input settings. It's stuff like, do you want it to be phantom power? So when you're in the menu, you press menu, and then you turn this dial to go up and down. So this is like an up and down, rotation right, rotation left, up and down. And so for your enter button, if you wanna go into something, you press the button in, or you press track jump forward. Okay, here we're doing, they're going into the record menu, and they're doing file type. So you would hit the button in to select file type, and then you would rotate it to go left and right, or you could do hitting forward track. I use the data dial as navigation and pressing enter, and I use these as things for selecting channels. So I don't use that for that, I just do this. It's weird, it's it's very 90s technology. It's it's like playing Grand Theft Auto where you have some, some kind of challenge where you have to like, use an RC copter and the controls are like some sort of yaw pitch thing where everything is counterintuitive to what you would think, but if you use it enough, you get used to it. We've jumped back in time. Preparation. Alkaline or nickel metal hydrate. Batteries is what they recommended. I don't know why lithium ion rechargeables wouldn't be possible. So you pop this thing open and then there's a little button you press to pop out the batteries. If you're changing the batteries, if you have another pair of batteries already ready and charged, if you pop it out and then switch it fast enough, when you pop it back in, it remembers the date and time. Not sure if that is capacitors or something holding enough power, how long that actually lasts. But otherwise, if you have to just wait for them to charge for four or six hours, you put it back in. Every time it's gonna ask you to set the date, you set it with the crown. Navigate with these buttons to go between. So anything that involves horizontal navigation, always using this as my navigation. And anything that involves going up and down, then I'm always using this. You're on your first field, you turn it, and then you advance forward and whatever until you're done. And then you press the button to do enter. Hitting the button is what gets you to the next screen where it loads up. So the first thing you're usually gonna do when you see the date time is turn it and be like, oh, what is this? I don't, I don't need to change this. You press the button and then it goes and it does a little film animation. You're like, ah, oh, I didn't set the date and time. You could set the date and time in the menu, 
but whatever. It's weird. It says enter set. It's one of those things. It's like there's an update available. Do you want to install this update? OK or download? What? What does that mean? <laughs> that's, that's how this feels. So yeah, if you think about recording in mono, you're saying that track one, track two, track three, track four, those are four tracks independent of each other. If you want to record stereo, you're either doing EXT in one, two, and you're recording two separate tracks, or you're recording, say you want to do stereo mics, you're doing input one, two, and again, two separate tracks, or you're doing your in built-in mics, which are, can only be tracks three and four. There's also stereo mode that makes it so tracks one and two or three and four record to an interleave stereo file and mix mode, which can record all four tracks to a two track stereo mix down. So if you don't wanna edit this stuff in post, you just want it however it is on the spot, you have to set your levels right and pan things the way you want them. It's like having a tiny mixing board. And each file is named in a way that makes it clear that this is track one of the sequence. So if you record a bunch of stuff, they're all gonna have the same file name, but there'll be a, a change where it says one, two, three, or four. So you'll know that, oh, these were all recorded at the same time. They're the same file. It's just tracks one, two, three, or four. They're different files, uh, but it's the same recording session. The same time you hit record will be easy to see. Aside from the fact that they'll all be exactly the same size and length. So by default, there's a folder called music inside of it. And uh, when I download, I sort by date created. And that way I'll know that time wise that this is the order of things and grab what I need to grab. So now setting channels to record. So if you see this one right there, I have channel three, that's an armed track. And the way it works, is you go into the menu and you say what tracks you want to record. You go to menu, basic, and then this is where you can say this, one, two, three, four. You hit each of those and it corresponds to channel one, two, three, four. So in this case, if say everything was off for whatever reason, I would go menu, press data dial because it's on menu option one, then I'd press number three, the forward jump, and then it will bring me to channel three. And then for record, I would press enter. And then I would dial, go from off to on, and I press it again to jump back. And then the next option is pan, which is only necessary if you're doing stereo. And I wanna be able to hear stereo while I'm recording it. I would do pan left, for channel one and pan right for channel two. And that way when I'm monitoring, I can actually hear it. So there's steps to how much gain is applied. With this Rode NTG5 is a pretty good boost on it. I am low gain. So that means that you see right now, there's my settings and I'm at 60%, about this far away from the mic. Low gain is good for stuff where you're really close up. Some mics don't have as much power, so sometimes you have to jump to medium gain. If you go all the way to the top and it's still not loud enough, then you know gain needs to be medium. Uh, but you can go up to high gain if you're recording something that's far away, like your typical shotgun mic. Like say you're recording birds or something or things in the distance, then you'd wanna go high gain. And there might be a, a setting, there might be a super high. Oh yeah, so high plus. <laughs> the next page, I could have just read the next page. And then input, you're selecting what your input is. In this case, for channel three, it can only be XLR or the mics in the back, stereo three, four, because the eighth inch is for channels one and two. So yeah, it's a little different than if you're used to using a DAW where you arm a track on the fly, like you go, oh, right, let me record, record, record. This is a menu diving. If you get something of uh, bigger versions of this, you'll see that you can arm each track. And it's a little more user friendly to think of it that way. But to make this thing small, they got to compact things in the menus. So there are no arm buttons. So with input, you have line, which is like, you know, you're plugging an eighth inch jack here. You're recording like something that is not a mic. Mic, which is, you know, you think like you're sure SM57 and Mic Plus Phantom, which is like what I have with the Rode NTG5. 
And we have the part about the limiter and the low cut filter, which I'm going to skip because I don't, I don't even recommend using it. So I guess this isn't the video for you if you're looking for that. Uh, compensating for mic distances. Again, a thing that isn't really necessary if you're doing everything in post. Basically, you can set the delay in milliseconds. If you have a mic that is further away than a mic that's closer, you would want to delay the closer mic so that they would be synced up. Okay, now for menu record, record settings, you could set your file type. File type stereo or mono. I record mono for a mic because it's one source. And I actually record everything in, in mono individual channels. You can record a two mix track where it is mixed signal in stereo, which is what I was talking about before. It's like having a tiny mixing board. And recording two track stereo is best when you're copying something that's already stereo recorded, even though I default to recording two separate mono files, it's just less settings to change. And then 16 or 24 bit, I record 24 bit. So that way I have as much vertical resolution to be able to boost in post. Yeah, I don't know if there's anything else to say. It doesn't take, audio files don't take up a lot of space. So if you're doing something that's gonna be put into an editor, just record 24 bit. You're gonna be exporting 16, but you got that room to work with. And then um, what's next? Oh yeah, sample rate. 44.1 is your standard for CD audio. 48 kilohertz is your standard for video. And it's not because 48 is just a little bit better and you can tell the difference. It's because 48 kilohertz is what works with syncing to video on the timeline. And I don't know a lot about this because I've only recorded 48 kilohertz, but from what I've heard, if you record 44.1 kilohertz and you have like dialogue and you're talking and you have long takes, that there's an issue with things getting out of sync. But you might wanna record 96 kilohertz if you plan to slow down audio. So say you're doing something where you're doing like a It's one of those kinds of whatever whatever they're doing on the internet now. You know what I'm talking about? Like where, like you got some GoPro footage and then it ramps down to super slow motion and the audio drops with it. So if you're, if you're recording 96K, you have more horizontal resolution. So if bit depth is vertical resolution from loudest to quietest, then sample rate is horizontal resolution. How much samples are taken along the curve of a sound wave, you know, through time. So the reason you'd want 9,600 kilohertz, so say you cut that audio track to half speed, well, then it doesn't sound combed. It sounds smooth. So it's something that's more about you deliberately knowing that you want to do that effect as opposed to saying, oh, I just record everything in 9,600 kilohertz. I mean, there's no foul to it. It just takes up more space. And it also syncs. Notice that 48 is half of 96. There, there's patterns in the way things sync. 44.1 is not half of anything. It's based on a totally different standard. CD's a certain way. It's enough samples for the Nyquist-Shannon theorem. It works, but there were, there were things that were created after. It's pretty impressive. 44.1 kilohertz is very impressive for a late 70s digital audio standard when five megabytes of storage costs like $10,000. Think about it that way, that they can make, we're gonna make these discs that hold 700 megabytes, what? That was the standard in the late 70s? Uh, you know, it didn't get adoption until the early 80s, I believe, but still, that's pretty advanced. So if anybody's poo-pooing on CD audio, MP3 compression is much bigger of a noticeable thing than whether or not your sampling rate is 44.1 or higher. So the default way for file naming, so you have Word, it says task cam, and then there's a number increment, and then S1. So if you progress through, like you're recording it, it would be task cam 0001, 0002, 0003. If it's a different track, S1 means it's recorded on track one. If you record it on track three, then it would be S3. And that's how you can look at your files and know which one's which. But it does change, like a stereo two mix would have a two at the end to tell you that it is a stereo mix. Creating a new file without interrupting recording. You can manually create a new file without pausing recording and set the unit to automatically do the same when file size reaches two gigabytes. So if you're manually, like, I wanna be safe, I wanna do a new thing. <laughs> Not the most memorable thing in the world, but you press that three track forward button, boom. Creates a new file, 
with an increment name. So if you're like, oh, I'm afraid I'm gonna lose something, let me save it. You do that like that. And yeah, the two gigabyte thing, um, again, I haven't really had much of a problem with losing data, so I don't, I don't know, I don't do it. But if you do, if you do want to create out small, smaller files, then go for it. But obviously then you have to sync all those files, which they should, once you've synced the front file, the rest of them should just connect. Simultaneously recording two files at different input levels. For example, when recording with microphones, you can make an ordinary recording with the input level set to high as possible and simultaneously record a slightly lower input level for safety. So then they're saved as separate files. So one channel saved as separate files. So data dial, record, record settings screen, dual rec options are off, and then you can increment between negative one and negative 12 dB. And really, I'd say if you're really concerned, you go towards that negative 12 dB. You probably maybe like negative 10 to negative 12 is really what you'd want in a safety track. Like negative one dB in a safety track is very unnecessary. And then once you've set it to on, every time you hit record, by default, you'll get the two lights and then you'll know you're, you're doing it. And file names for dual recording adds a D. If it would be S12 wave, it would be D12 minus, and then whatever the decibel drop is. So in this example, it's dropped five decibels. And also when you're doing a dual recording, so like if you're doing track one and two dual recording, tracks three and four will be changed to represent a dropped gain. So you basically turn this into a two track recording. You can't do four tracks, four inputs, and then also dual record four inputs. So autotone is like, if you have this going out to the camera and you wanna record on this and you wanna record on the camera, basically if you're pressing the slate button, you're, you're creating a tone that it's basically like a fancy way of doing this. And autotone is just a way of saying, do this automatically every time you hit record because it knows what you're doing. You don't have to remember to do it and it makes it easier to sync in software. It's slate settings. You can set what you want the volume to be. Default is negative 12 dB, which is always a good default. Mid-side microphones, which is something I don't know a lot about. So read up if you feel like it. This unit has a mid-side decoder and can be used to record with a mid-side mic. So I'll just show that page. I've never used a mid-side microphone, I'll tell you that. So I don't really know anything about them. Recording duration chart, working with files. So if you want to be able to actually um, check something, you can go to the browse screen and, and view the actual contents and play them back. You do menu and then you go to browse and then you can see all the contents of the folder. Usually what I end up doing is if I just recorded something, I just press play and I listen to it. And if it's the track before, I just go backtrack. So that's how I usually do it, but you can see everything you have on it. So browsing in more depth is in the menu. You can actually create folders and stuff on here. It's not, not something I would be doing. So if you're into that and same thing with deleting stuff, you could, I guess if you know it takes bad, you can delete it. But usually what I do when I have a bad take is I just make a note about it. It's good to have something. If all your computers are used for something, then to have a piece of paper saying like first take was bad, not going to use it. Third take was a mistake. I hit record or whatever. I'll also usually dictate it in the video. So if I do the clap start and I say, recording before this was a mistake, I hit record by accident, forget about it, or I forgot to hit record in the last video file, the last video has no audio from this. It's just, it's just the camera and now I'm redoing it with the audio. And either way, it makes it so I know what's going on. So the beginning of each track has information about what it is in the context of things. Just the little notes like that make it easier. As soon as you're unloading, it's all about stitching stuff up and, and having that fresh memory of having done the horrible nightmare that is this <laughs> fresh in your mind. So that way you can hook everything up in the editor. And then a couple days later, you're gonna totally forget about all of this and what a nightmare it was, but everything will be so organized and you'll have all your notes and you'll have all your metadata that you'll be able to digest it at a higher level to actually edit it because it doesn't matter how many takes something I do. It just matters what's on the timeline when I'm editing. 
Yeah, this is a very video-centric video, by the way, but obviously it's also a field recorder, so you can just record samples and stuff like that, which is, you know, that's the thing I do. I don't always record video with this. Sometimes I record sound effects, ambient sounds, and this and that. Connecting to a computer. You know, I just pop out the SD card. I find that on a Mac, it is kind of annoying to connect. You might have better luck on Windows, but for me, I just pop out the SD card. The way it's supposed to work is you have your micro USB plug and you go into a USB-A to your computer and you just see the drive pop up on your desktop or whatever explorer menu, however it would work on Windows. And you pull it and it's the same thing. If you take out the SD card and you pop it in your computer, it does the same thing on a Mac. I just pop out the SD card. Another reason to plug it into your computer is to do firmware updates, which again, Tascam is not really known for their firmware updates. It's kind of like maybe if something's brand new, they might do a couple. I think there's only a couple firmware updates on this. In the menu system, you have stuff like your power saving functions, which can be annoying, but it's also important. So you can set it so that the backlight is always on. Obviously, that's going to use more battery. And then display contrast is a setting. Restoring the factory settings. That's a very specific thing that you would really only need if you wanted to factory reset this thing. Rare. I guess if you're selling it, but whatever. Formatting SD card. You can format it in here. I don't, I mean, other than like the first time you get one, you wanna format it. But I get to a point where I leave files on it for a long time as like a triple backup. And when I get to a point where I'm so much months past and I know I'm totally done with all that stuff and it's there's very rarely do I actually need the space, but then I'll just delete a chunk file name format, you can set your file name format, and it would be by type, which is either word or date. Actually, now I think about it, what is mine? Yeah, mine's by name, name and increment. You know what? Now that I think about it, date would be more useful. I might actually change my file name format to date. I mean, what I know it's a task cam, but at the same time, it could be useful if you have multiple field recorders to say like, oh, this is from a task cam, or this is from a a zoom or whatever and the date is in the metadata for the file so you can sort by time but i think it's always the thing you have to look out for is just not being confused by what something is if something is like a one-off like a patch or something you might want to add an appendice to the thing like intro patch or something you know if you're coming back and you're recording just a little snippet makes it easier to manage. This does have a foot switch and a remote control. I'll leave that up to you if you want to get that kind of thing. I've never used it. Okay, here's the messages. Most of them are very straightforward. There is a message for no SD card, which is always a fear with everything as an SD card. Did I put the SD card back in? This is a thing that it actually will detect if there isn't an SD card. But still, you always want to check. You always want to make sure. Things to watch out for. A lot of troubleshootings are like, did you try this dummy? That's how I feel about most troubleshooting pages. I, there's a few that I think in here that are useful, but we're going to skip that. And then I guess kind of important is operational temperature. The only time I've ever lost a recording on this, or it probably failed to record, is when I was recording below freezing. And I think I had been recording for about an hour. And this thing is not rated for below freezing. It's 32 to 104 Fahrenheit or zero to 40 Celsius. And that's a limitation of prosumer gear. If you want to reliably record below freezing temps, just save yourself the trouble and get something spec for that. It's not worth the anxiety. I think uh, basically what happened in that instance though, is that I had been recording a bunch of stuff and I had started a track and then I realized I needed to get something. So I stopped it and then it kind of like froze up weird. And I was kind of like, I'm glad I didn't record. I don't know what that was. Like, okay. And then I shut it down, but it, I left it where it was. I, I went and I grabbed that thing and I came back and I turned it on and it seemed to be fine, but I wasn't paying attention. When I hit record, the numbers, it's always a thing with your phone, with this, check the time numbers. The numbers weren't going, they were stayed zero, zero, zero. And I can't remember if the light went, but I remember finishing the take and it wasn't, it wasn't very dialogue heavy, so I was able to use that phone audio. And I went to, to stop and it, it wasn't recording. And I was like, what? So in that case, it wasn't, it wasn't a big deal. 
I, I didn't lose a bunch of dialogue like this. That would really, really piss me off if I recorded all of this and I had no, no dialogue. But it is a thing that I remember. And other than that, it's been very reliable. I've never lost recordings. And the only time I've ever had issue is, is it was my own fault. I either moved one of these dials by accident while moving it, and then it changed my levels, and I ended up clipping, which is why it's always good to have this in view. Obviously, right now, I'm doing it in a way where it is not ideal for it to be not facing me, but that's that's it on this. I think this video is long enough. We'll, we'll see what this whole, if reading the instruction manuals is actually even a good idea to do for videos, but I'm done.